Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everybody. Uh, welcome to SETI Live. My name is Simon Steele. I'm the Deputy Director of the Carl Sagan Center uh, at the SETI Institute, but I am not currently at the SETI Institute. I am in the beautiful uh, city of New Orleans, where the annual meeting of the American Astronomical Society, the AAS, is meeting. So lots of uh, astronomers gather together, lots of exciting things going on. Um, one uh, uh, person who is not here is is my guest and a familiar face to you all, uh, uh, Franck Marchis, senior astronomer at the SETI Institute. Franck, uh, before we get into the, the, the details of today, uh, why aren't you here? Uh, because I'm at the CES, the Consumer Electronics Show, to uh, present the new telescope of Unistellar called the Odyssey. Okay. And you are, uh, that's Las Vegas you're in at the moment. No, sorry, so, yes. Oh, you can yeah. see from the is Las Vegas, no? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so we're both in, in, in very, very fun cities. And, uh, but we're working, of course. Um, so Frank, you, yes. you, <laughs> uh, this is, this is a, a technology conference that you are at. Um, and so obviously there's, there's technologies of all, of all forms, but, um, uh, what is the astronomy presence like there? Uh, what's the excitement there in, in, uh, for you? Well, there is, in fact, there is a lot of uh, astronomy over there happening at the moment. Um, uh, Celestron, Celestron just announced the new telescope, the Origin. Mm -hmm. um, Vaonis uh, announced as well another telescope called uh, Vespera 2, if I remember. And uh, Unistellar announced the Odyssey range which is mm -hmm. the telescope I have in the back here, um, a smaller telescope, uh, easier telescope to use. But we're going to talk about that in more details, I'm assuming, in the future, in a few minutes. We are. And um, I see a lot of people uh, tuning in. Thank you very much. We've got people from uh, Turkey, Germany, Southern California, Northern Ireland. Um, thank you for letting us know where you're, you're, you're tuning in from. Andrew is from Colombia. Welcome. Uh, if you do have any questions um, uh, as we continue our conversation, please do put them in the, the comment section and uh, we'll bring them up and, and try and answer as many as we can. Um, I know a lot of people on the call will be familiar with, with the EV scope, um, but it may be good just to sort of rewind a little bit um, back to the beginning of the sort of the philosophy and, and, and the, 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 the construction of, of of an EV scope in general, obviously, and then we'll talk about how how the technology has advanced and and the, and the new telescope we have here. So, so what makes um, you know uh, these are small telescopes. Uh, I have had the pleasure of using one for some time, um, and had the pleasure of, of being able to test the the new one. And we'll talk more about the the usability in a bit. But uh, for people who haven't um, uh, used an EV scope, uh, what what does it do, and, and how does it do it, Frank? So the EV scope is a digital smart telescope. It's kind of a partner for you to explore the, the dark sky. Uh, it's a telescope uh, which has electronics integrated in it, and you you control it with an app. Mm -hmm. And when so by, when you get the telescope, you get the telescope access to the app. You connect the telescope to uh, to your phone with the app, and mm -hmm. basically the telescope will uh, guide, will align itself and guide itself and um, and give you a list of targets you can observe. So that's the first step. Mm -hmm. like one of one of the problems we have been trying to solve at Unistellar is to make astronomy as accessible, seamless for people. Mm -hmm. um, you probably, most people in watching this have a telescope or purchase a telescope in their life, and they probably remember how complicated it was uh, to uh, learn how to focus it to collimate it, all of these weird words that we use in astronomy, collimating, whatever. And then we also, and you also have to find a target to observe. And I mean, it's easy to find Jupiter, Saturn, and the, the moon, because mm. we see them in the sky. But in fact, the telescope is made to observe things which are fainter than what you can see with naked eyes. So mm -hmm. if you don't have a reference, you don't know how to find them. Yeah. We basically integrated in, this, in a telescope, a brain, that take this, take guide you, and this guiding make that people can observe the the dark sky and enjoy again the dark sky. Mm -hmm. Plus, it works in cities, and that's really something we've been fixing as a problem. We see less and less stars because of light pollution, 
-hmm. But with electronic systems, now we can uh, improve the vision and see um, see galaxy and nebulae in color even from cities. Yeah. And that's the thing, we'll come on to the, the, the idea of, of networking these and, and um, um, doing research level observations. But the initial thing that's so exciting about this and something, um, you know, I, I stuck a picture behind my head of, of M27, the Dumbbell Nebula, that was taken basically uh, in, a, in an urban environment with sort of floodlights. It was uh, next to a dog park, which, which is fine. Um, I didn't have my dog with me. Uh, but uh, you know, it, it's that's a three-minute exposure of the dumbbell nebula, which which is a, a very faint um, object. It's a very tricky object to find and to enjoy with with a, a simple optical telescope. And certainly, if you're trying to introduce as an educator, you're trying to introduce some um, some you know uh, astrophysics into your observations and things like stellar evolution. Uh, and you haven't got, you know, you've got these sort of uh, very light polluted skies, it's very difficult to, to bring up those as examples. And so for an education point of view in urban areas, it, it's an amazing tool uh, and it's beautiful. And you can see the, the, the lovely color spread you get from, from this detector as well. Um, so that, that's, that's the first thing that's, that's very, very exciting is to be able to, to look at these deep sky objects from, from urban areas. Um, the other aspect of it, you say, Frank, is is the the networking uh, capabilities of this because of if you are uh, an amateur astronomer who wants to take their observations a step further, and or if you're you know a, a college or school who uh, do have some funds to, to to purchase a telescope like this, it allows you to actually get involved um, much more deeply into um, you know quite serious observations um that uh, you can move forward with so i, I think we'll, we'll we'll maybe sort of talk about the, the citizen science aspects later um but uh maybe because right behind you is 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 the beautiful new odyssey model yep. um so i think uh you you better uh, point it out to us and and show us what's what's exciting about this yeah thing. i just realized on this video you have no idea of the size so look i'm gonna take a yes. mug as a reference yeah. <laughs> all right so it's like uh, two mugs. Two mugs right. worth. Yep. It's not, not big, OK? Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a four kilogram telescope. So you can carry it easily in a small backpack in the tripod. Uh, what is key here and you don't see, and that's really what we're trying to make it to, to make people understand there is a lot of technological wonders in this telescope. Mm. Uh, you don't need to collimate the telescope. When you get the telescope, it's aligned, perfectly aligned. You do this alignment when doing the manufacturing. We partner with Nikon, um, company, Japanese company, and we develop, we use, uh, we develop a technology with them um, to seal the telescopes, basically, so it doesn't move. Uh, and then we have um, also a system that focus the telescope continuously during the night. So when you observe, you know, focus can change because of change of temperature and so on. The, mm -hmm. the, the telescope uses the images that it's collecting to analyze if there is a change of focus and basically move the detector on the small parts on the, at the micrometer step so you can see, uh, you can get always the best uh, image, always at focus. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, um, uh, Frank has, has frozen on my screen, so I'm going to um, uh, say a little bit about the, uh, the telescope. And um, uh, because one thing that I liked about it is that uh, the, the compactness of it compared to um, uh, the EV scope one, which uh, we could have that, the, the comparison of the, of the first telescope uh, with, with the second. Um, but uh, it is certainly much, much more compact. Um, it's, uh, uh, you know, the, 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 the old EV scope was portable, but um, uh, it, it, it was a little bit 
chunky to, to travel around with it. The, the, the new telescope is certainly much easier and, and transportable. And certainly if you're traveling for star parties, um, uh, it's, uh, you can fit it into your carry-on, which you could not do with, with the old telescope. The other thing that um, uh, is uh, interesting with the new telescope actually is uh, I, was, I was looking for ways to focus it when I, when I got it out of the box and I wanted to collimate it and focus it, um, but it did it itself, which is a little bit frustrating if you would like playing around with, with, with the, uh, the telescope itself. It's very, very self-automated as it uh, um, you know, sets up that collimation and that focusing as Frank said. Now, I know we have lost Frank, um, and hopefully we will get him back in a moment. So while we do that, I just want to uh, call out um, Julia um, for the 100 stars on Facebook. Thank you so much for those stars. Um, and um, we have a couple of questions as well that we can talk about. Uh, ah, here's Frank. Hi, Frank. I don't know when you start losing me. I think people are waking up in Las Vegas. And, and they're uh, turning on their computers. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I was, um, uh, look, you look good now at the moment. So there's a couple of questions um, in, in, in the comments. So I um, want to take a look at that. And first comment is, is that this a four inch telescope as far as the aperture is concerned? So is uh, no, it's not a four inch telescope. It's uh, uh, let me see the exact number because I was just looking at this. So I, it's um, and as Frank steps away to check the dimensions of the telescope, um, the uh, uh, Tim will get back to the the question about tracking. Um, it certainly is very, very good for, for tracking and certainly for long, long observations. And that's what the, the, the software especially is very, very good at here. So um, you can do reasonably long, uh, deep exposures uh, for um, uh, deep sky objects, but also if you're doing monitoring um, and time variation and everything. So uh, let's have a look at some more comments here. While Frank uh, 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 fixes his internet connection, um, one thing that we are excited about because uh, uh, Unistellar being a company that manufactures telescopes uh, has um, agreements um, and collaborative agreement with the SETI Institute, hence we're doing this SETI Live. Um, the, the instrument has been very, very useful in some of our education programs. Uh, we're very happy that um, uh, uh, through various grants, we have been able to supply um, EV scopes to uh, community colleges uh, around the US. Um, colleges that don't have their own facilities, their own uh, observatories or planetaria, um, uh, but are teaching astronomy classes. And uh, um, the telescope is, is not cheap. Uh, um, Frank will say a little bit more about the, the pricing uh, when he returns. But what's nice about, um, you know, if you do have the capacity to get one of these telescopes for a college that does not have um, its own facilities, is that uh, it uh, allows you to do very good observational work, even if your college is in an urban environment um, and uh, for student projects and so on. And to get involved in in uh, more sophisticated networking uh, uh, research projects. So, Frank, hi. Um, to, no. Talking a little bit about um, the the um, collaboration with the SETI Institute and and Unistellar and and the use for of the telescopes in in teaching in um, in uh, colleges that don't have uh, their own facilities, and it's been incredibly useful for that. Um, but. Uh, so yeah, I can hear you now. Switch to my yeah. uh, to my yeah. cell phone directly. Okay. okay. So what was the question? You want me to talk about education? Uh, no, well, we, we yes. Yeah, so let's carry. Then we'll go back to the dimension of the telescope. It's um, we're, I'm talking a little bit about uh, 
beyond uh, amateur astronomers, um, the use of this in education for, for colleges that don't have the facilities uh, of their own, it's been really, really uh, very useful for, for those instructors and their students. Yeah, we have uh, multiple telescopes that's been uh, uh, adopted by community colleges. Specifically, we have a program with the Moore Foundation, the UCAN program, where we uh, shipped uh, telescopes in uh, 35 community colleges in the US. But in fact, we, are, we found out that way more colleges have now adopted the Unistellar Telescope as a tool to teach. Uh, one of the reasons is because it's uh, seemingly less to use it. I mean, they do work. Um, no matter what, uh, there is, you, will not, you will not forget a cable with a unistellar mm -hmm. telescope. That's something that uh, you go to a star <laughs> party, yes. probably people remember that. You go to a star party, you take your telescope, camera, and all of this, you arrive there, you forget something. Well, yeah. with a telescope like this, it's basically a, uh, an integrated instrument. You don't have mm -hmm. to bring accessories, you just have everything. So that's the main point. The second point is that the students, can use the telescope themselves with the app and they can be all together watching through the app as well through the eyepiece. They can send each other control of the telescope. So it's really an interactive event. It's a star party where everybody can be operator for a few minutes and decide what they want to see. Everybody can save the image on their phone if you're observing together, for instance. Uh, we did that last night in Las Vegas uh, with mm -hmm. a journalist and they really loved it, in fact, that they could. And the, the thing I did not realize, I realized that yesterday, in fact, is that some journalists had, was from Germany, other was from France, and I uh, was in the U, uh, my US, US tel, uh, cell phone. And in yeah. fact, we all could see the language, the description of the object in the language of, uh, of our phones. So that was, uh, that was a, cr a cool moment. It's really, the point here is that we, it's an experience observing mm -hmm. with a unistellar telescope. It's more like a, you can learn and you can control. You see where the object is, the direction of the sky when you come close to the eyepiece. And that's mm -hmm. one of the mm -hmm. reasons I, I think I love seeing this telescope in the end of instructors. And I can do great scientific studies. I mean, we have papers with uh, teachers uh, who observe uh, comets, asteroids, uh, transiting exoplanets, uh, uh, supernova last, last year in the pinwheel galaxy. Um, and we have more of them. In fact, we have more paper to write that we can. So we're going to have to find a solution, maybe uh, create an AI for that, to, to write papers yeah. for us. <laughs> That's, I mean, you've, you've sort of answered a question here, that, uh, Neil, in, in the chat, is the Odyssey purely for observing, i.e. you can't take pictures with it? In fact, the nice thing is during the observations, and you can you can take this take this over, is that is that it does record on your phone um, the image that you are just just um, integrating. Do you want to say a little bit more about that? Yeah. So on your phone, you have an image which is the a stack image. We say it's astrophotography live. So you have an image to get better as the telescope collect more and more photons. We have an algorithm on board that are adapted for different type of object. That's the novelty we have now with the ODC. We, we basically have a, a software that change based if you're observing a tiny object like Jupiter to a large object like uh, uh, the moon. So you have different algorithm based on the target. And that's one thing. So this image is saved, but then you can also access to the raw data I can do your own analysis later on. So you can do photograph, phot photometry, astrometry, if you are, if you fancy that, or you can also use this raw data to do your own astrophotography. And we have some example of people have done astrophotography using our telescopes, revealing some amazing uh, beauty of, of targets after observing for 10 days, for instance. Mm -hmm. And that's wonderful, isn't it? Because as you say, the, the, the image you get from the telescope, the one behind my head is, is just a JPEG um it's it's beautiful in itself um but in a sense it's a snapshot isn't it uh and what you would like to do if, if you're serious about astrophotography is, is download the raw data um which you can do by going to the website um and accessing your your data which is stored there uh and then then you can stick in the photoshop or whatever software package you have and, and really come out with some you know very very beautiful images which is fabulous um so um 
the Odyssey, uh, it's it's different from the earlier telescopes. It's certainly smaller and more more portable. Um, I I know that having ported ported the the EV scope one around and and this one, it, it's it's wonderfully portable. So um, the opportunities to 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 link up with more people and different places is great. Um, the the self focusing and self collimation. Um, Sort of takes away some of the fun. I'm going to say that. I'm going to say that's a, that put down as a negative. No, I'm kidding. Um, yeah, uh, only you will think that it's fun to go outside. <laughs> <laughs> um, I you know, and obviously the electronics. Are, you know, you, you've you've learned a lot from the EV Scope One and EV Scope Two. Um, yeah. In in this, and say a little bit about you know from a, an engineering perspective rather than an astronomical perspective. Um, as the, as, you know, you are wanting to improve, obviously, all the time. Um, how, how is how is the R and D for you, uh, without obviously going into sort of um, protected information? Well, we um, we have been focusing in getting so this telescope um, in this telescope. We try to find the sweet spot between the portability and the seamless to use, right? So. The size, the weight has been kind of the, the definition of the what we wanted. We knew what we wanted to build, and then we designed the, the telescope based on this main criteria. Um, what you want to know, but we, we have a, the, the OLED display of Nikon. Mm -hmm. It's it's a very good. It's not a screen only, because that's what I heard a lot. It's, mm -hmm. it's an immersive device. When you look through it, you eye focus at the infinity, so you see like if you're observing in, in a telescope. Mm -hmm. I really love the, the, the eyepiece. I'm more and more convinced that it's one of the major um, major asset that we have in terms of experience. Um, the, this, the display, the sensor is an IMX detector. Um, we, um, we have a resolution good enough for a large, large picture, so something like a three to four megapixel or something like that. Um, when you download the data, you have access to all the information, what observer, what detector you have been using, etc. So people, people, when you do astrophotography, you have basically access to this, um, to the information, the size of the pixel, etc. I have this written on my computer, but I cannot touch it now because my cell phone is attached <laughs> to my computer. So I'm basically right now looking yeah. at a blank page and you. Yeah. Um, okay. That's good. But, yeah. <laughs> um, I agree with that, you know, the, with, um, first of all, the image is so good. I remember, you know, and even looking through, looking through a root, you know, uh, an optical telescope and just a sort of uh, normal eyepiece, when you look at Saturn, and I'm sure a lot of people have, 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 um, done this and looked through Saturn with a reasonable size telescope, it looks completely fake. I mean, it looks like a little yellow sort of, uh, marble stuck on, on the end. And you think that can't possibly be real. It's, it's such a breathtaking thing when you, when you think about what you're seeing. Um, and again, with the images from, from the EV scope, they are, are so, you know, beautiful, um, and almost like, you know, doing a Google image search. I think it's very important to be able to look into a telescope, you know, it's great, obviously the, the practicality and the, uh, of having a screen, having an iPad or, you know, a, a phone to, to project that image. That is wonderful. And of course, astronomers don't look through telescopes anymore anyway. You know, you don't yeah. even have to be in the same country to use a telescope, which is, again, is, takes away some of the romance, I think. But um, uh, to be able to look through an eyepiece, um, as we're all used to doing with with a, a, a camera, most, most of these uh, EVFs, electronic viewfinders now, very few... Um, I'm an old fogey with an SLR where you actually have light coming through, but, but electronic viewfinders are so commonplace now that, that you do get the feeling that you are looking at the object uh, and looking into a telescope is very, very important. So, so I applaud um, the eyepiece remaining in this new yeah. technology. I agree. Something I wanted to say about the technology, which is, I think, more important than the pixels and so on, is that we also design a telescope which is versatile capable of observing planets, the moon, the sun, comets, mm -hmm. galaxies, nebulae. And it doesn't, it may, may not seem to be different for most people, but those are different objects in size. Planets are very small and very bright. Uh, 
the moon is very big and very bright and mm -hmm. the galaxy are large extended but very faint all of this uh, it's very difficult to have a telescope capable of observing all of those objects mm -hmm. this telescope is capable of doing this uh, because of this technology we have implemented on board the multi-depth technology which is a system that changed the scaling basically on the image and the way we the telescope stack the image and combine them so we always have the best combination of sensitivity sensitivity versus pixel pixel size mm -hmm. for each of those objects and you see it uh, yesterday we observed jupiter in las vegas and you can see the bend and be the bends and the belt and mm -hmm. people loved it, it was that was uh, there was it was exciting to see that and you can see the um, uh, the resolution how it's very increasing over time with, with, with this new algorithm by, by the way this algorithm is also some development we do for the odyssey will go we are going to the generation one as well it's mm -hmm. not we don't do things only for the odyssey we do development software development for both the generation one and generation two yeah yeah got a question here um we had a question earlier about the 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 diameter of the uh, the primary um the field of view for the odyssey as well the field of view of the odyssey okay so the mirror diameter is was 85 millimeter for those who did not answer my did not hear my answer the focal is 3.9 okay. the field of view uh 33.6 but time 45 arc minute okay so just over half a degree um field which is obviously perfect for the you know uh the moon which is in and the sun exactly. um uh i if you've got anything bigger than that, uh, for example, Andromeda is about uh, two degrees, so so you're not going to get the full Andromeda in. Uh, you certainly get the, the the nucleus and some of the the um, uh, dust lanes close to the nucleus of the galaxy is good, but uh, it's perfect for um, uh, the certainly the moon. Uh, you mentioned the sun, Frank. The sun is generally not you know something you think about pointing a regular telescope. It, you have solar filters as we got the eclipse coming up certainly in north america um uh people are excited about um doing solar observing so there is a a, a, a filter for the the, the uh, uh ev scope yeah and there will probably be one for the for the odc okay okay so at the moment, you, I know I, there is one for ev scope one because i have one but um the odyssey is is uh obviously hot off the, the production line, but uh, there's yes, going to be yeah. yeah, we announced it two days ago, so yeah. just <laughs> let us catch us our breath and then we make additional <laughs> announcement. Uh, oh, things that people have been asking uh, yesterday so that I want to mention. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, we have a battery, it's five hours autonomy, mm -hmm. but you, now you can remove the battery directly. So you probably remember when you take an airplane, Mm -hmm. Now you can just remove the battery and you put it in your backpack and done. That's, I, I know it looks like a detail, but it's been something that I've been boring, annoying me the fact that I have to, to remove manually my battery. And it was a complex on the Gen 1. So on the Gen 2, you can remove the battery like that and store mm -hmm. it in your backpack when you travel. Yeah. I've had that nightmare actually at, at the, the bag check with the EV scope one. So anyway, that's, a, that's another story. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, uh, uh, David asks if we can uh, see some images. Frank, I don't know if you can bring up um, images. No, me. because I'm on my phone. But the one um, is from the Odyssey uh, of M27. Um, and that's you, from do, a, you have access to our website? Because there's a lot of observation uh, of images on our website, if I remember. So, um, uh, if we can put up the uh, uh, the link to the Unistellar website, yeah, um, and uh, certainly, uh, let me see if I can. I, you know, why you're trying to do that? Let me see if I can share a picture on my phone. Yes. I... 
No, I cannot share a picture of my phone being on this, unfortunately. Ah. So, I, I know the website less well than you do, Frank, of course. So, um, let me try and find some images. So, Frank, while I'm uh, uh, taking a peek at, at the Unicel website, and I'll, I'll try and bring that up, say a little bit about the, the citizen science projects that you've run, um, obviously not with the Odyssey yet, but with, with previous telescopes. Um, give us an example maybe of um, the, the um, asteroid occultation um, observations, which I think is amazing because that really does show the power of um, you know, a network of small telescopes. Yes, yeah, so an asteroid occultation is when you uh, look at an asteroid passing between you and a star. So you can imagine that uh, you have a very far distant star and there is an asteroid passing by. And the shadow of the asteroid will basically travel on the surface of our planet. So if people who are, if, when people are located on the path of totality, if they look up, they will see the star disappearing for a few seconds, typically. If the... Um, if there is multiple observers, they will see the timing at different time because of the irregular shape of the asteroid. So it's basically, we have imagined my, my hands are floating above, uh, above the ground and you can see the shadow of my hands. And there is people observing the shadow from the top, from the bottom up, and they will see basically the star disappearing, reappearing at different timing. So we have been using this te technique to observe occultation, to observe asteroids for multiple reasons. One, they give us an exact position of the asteroid. So that's refined what we call the ephemeris, the orbit of the asteroid. So we know exactly where this asteroid is located. Two, we know the size of the asteroid by combining multi, uh, the timing of the chord and the, the motion of the a shadow. We can er derive the, the size of the asteroid itself. And three, if you have multiple uh, observers, you can see the shape, guess the shape, the projected shape of the asteroid. And I will say four. If you have, if you are lucky and there is a moon and rings around the asteroid, you will be able to detect them. So these occultations are a great tool, but you need to have multiple people observing them at the same time to be able to get a significant result. Because most of the time, the position of the asteroid is not well known, so there is a large uncertainty plus or minus 100 kilometer for an asteroid, which is a few kilometers in diameter, for instance. So we have done multiple of them. I can give you a ton of examples, but one of the most successful one was uh, the observation of Yuri Bates in October 2022. Uh, we're working on a paper at the moment. Uh, the occultation was crossing um, an area from Spain to France to Sweden to give you a, to a rough idea of the geometry. And we, we got 18 positive codes, but more than 70 people participated. 300 of them attempted to observe it, but the weather was bad. Um, in these 18 unistellar telescope codes, we have, by combining them, we can see the shape of Eurybates. Eurybates is a Trojan asteroid and is a target of the NASA Lucy mission. So this is a very important asteroid to characterize now because we are going to, we have launched a mission that's going to observe this asteroid um, in a few days. So having some kind of information about the shape, the size of the asteroid is very useful for the engineer and scientists at NASA because now they know where to point the, the, the spacecraft, for instance, or they will know there is moons around it, for instance. Um, the result we got from this occultation is that there is a large crater on Eurybates, a very large one. And, um, and it will be probably a target of the mission because when there is a crater, you can expect to see fresh material or deep, deep into the asteroid. So we want to see what an asteroid is made of. It's better to look inside the crater because then you get some information about the interior of the asteroid. So that's some example. By we have a small telescope like that, you can do this type of occultation and contribute to, uh, to the exploration of um, asteroids uh, using occultation techniques. And these data are used later on by NASA scientists. Yeah. And as you say, there have been some publications with um, uh, some of the uh, 
observations. There was the the, the Dart impact observations, and uh, obviously the supernova in um, uh, M one hundred one. I yep. remember. Um, so the Dart for the Dart, we pub we were the only team that published live. The published the live of the of the impact. Mm -hmm. uh, we also did it live. For you remember that, and. Um, yeah, I mean HST JWST missed the uh, missed the impact. We observe it and publish it with uh, we have a network because yeah. you have telescopes everywhere in Africa as well. Yeah, it really is, you know, shows the power of of, of the telescope. You know, so having such a small small instrument can make this sort of dramatic contribution to to astronomy. Um, astronomers. Astronomy has always been a, a, a science where the amateur, um, and by, you, we use the word amateur in the sense that you're not getting paid to do it, rather than somebody you know whose whose you know skill level is is lower because some uh, amateur astronomers have a much higher skill level than a lot of professionals. Um, but you know the the the, the contribution from from uh, amateur astronomers in astronomy has has always been huge. Uh, and in a sense, I felt that that was that, that was losing ground, you know, in, in modern times, because obviously the technology of space telescopes and large ground based means that, you know, what can you do out in the backyard in a sense. But but this is really changing that that sort of trajectory uh, and giving back, you know, some level of sort of uh, uh, significance to amateur astronomers using small instruments. And that's very, very yeah. exciting. And that can, continues we a very long tradition. We don't call them as amateur astronomers anymore. We call them citizen astronomers in, at yes. Unistera. Yes. And we have more than 2,000 of them mm -hmm. who are active on our Slack. Uh, we have more than, last year, we have 4,000 observations of occultation collected by uh, amateur, uh, citizen astronomers. Mm -hmm. um, for the supernovae, we have more than 250 observations of the supernovae from, from yeah. them. Yeah, that's exciting. Um, before we, we wrap up, uh, just a couple of uh, questions we have here um, uh, from David. Can you explain how exoplanets are observed uh, quickly? With, with yeah, yourself? very quickly. We don't see the exoplanet. We see the shadow of the exoplanet as it's passing in between us and the star. So we see an attenuation of the brightness of the, of the, of the star because of the, because of the planet passing, by, passing in front of us in front of the star and from that we can derive the confirm the existence of the planet mm -hmm. which is something important because tests detect a lot of candidates and that there is a way to confirm it is to, to have additional observation of transits and the second thing is that we can refine the, the orbit and see some variation in the orbit that could be due to the presence for instance of additional planets so we um, we have confirmed multiple uh, transiting exoplanets detected by tests uh, Lauren Gro is working right now on a, on a new paper uh, with a confirmation of one of them. Daniel, Daniel Peluso is finishing his PhD where he has basically published uh, a large number of uh, confirm confirming confirmation of exoplanets uh, using uh, the Unistellar Citizen Science Network. So thank you very much to all our citizen scientists because when they observe for three, four hours those, that, those, those exoplanets, it, we, it's not lost. We are using them. Just give us some time. It takes a long time to publish a paper, as you know. <laughs> Great. Um, one question, which you may not want to answer, me direct this back to the website. Um, uh, from Sentil, uh, do you provide an option to trade in an upgrade on on uh, uh, scopes? Uh, no, I don't have an answer for that yet. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So there's a there is an information uh, uh, email that you can go to on on the website to yeah. uh, get information about that. Exactly. Um, uh, Neil asks, what's the difference between the Odyssey and the Odyssey Pro, which are two new models coming up? Yeah. So the Odyssey Pro has an eyepiece. This is an Odyssey Pro because you can see the eyepiece here, mm -hmm. and a slightly better resolution. Okay. Okay. And a slightly higher price point. Yeah. Of course, yeah. yeah, I forgot to mention that. <laughs> but all of this information, of course, is on the um, Unistellar website. Um, Frank, anything you'd like to, to wrap up that you think we haven't covered about new scope? Oh, it's very exciting. Um, I have been using it. It's a wonderful uh, piece of technology. It's a wonderful way to introduce the sky to people. 
um, and a wonderful way for people to get involved in, in meaningful um, uh, astronomical observations uh, in, in, a, in a research sense. Yeah, I, being here at, Unis, um, at CES make me realize, yeah, we have all this announcement of additional telescope coming on the market. Mm -hmm. I mean, we've started this in 2017. Uh, Unistella with the support of City Institute for the Citizen Science. And I will say it's been a great adventure. But mm -hmm. it's, a, it's great to see that we started something that people now are catching up on. Um, the Odyssey, it's really the telescope of my kind of my dream, I would say. <laughs> <laughs> Most people say, yeah, it's, I, will, I will love to have a 10 meter class telescope in my backyard. Yeah. I'm not sure mm -hmm. if I want that because it's complicated to manage. But having like uh, having like a, a network of 10, 20, 50,000 people observing mm -hmm. together, sharing data, um, organizing campaigns, this mm -hmm. is going to happen. We are working on making community more involved in the citizen science, but also capable of community will be able to generate their own project in the future. Mm -hmm. This is really the, the telescope, the telescope of uh, of my dream as an as, as a professional astronomer yeah and astronomy for everyone uh, this is a everyone. global um uh yeah that's safe for, for 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 everybody the space is for everyone uh, and it's great yeah we build this giving access on the country around the yeah, world giving access to telescopes to people everywhere in the world has been kind of the main goal we have uh, we received data like I've uh, have some telescope who went to India in a school recently and they sent me oh, often some kind of uh, updates and I see pictures where they observe they do uh, observation as well in Bangladesh at the moment uh, we are just shipping a telescope in Nepal as wow. well so we are growing the network uh, with partnerships and partners around the world so okay. cool. Thank you, Frank. Um, good to Thank see you. Thank you very much. And see you in person again soon. Thank you, everybody, for, for tuning in. Obviously, if you need more information or want more information about the telescope, go to the Unistellar website. We, we posted the link. If you want to know more about what the SETI Institute is doing, pop over to see us at SETI.org, and that will have details of the citizen science programs that Frank mentioned um, that are running at the moment. Um, other than that, take care, everyone, and we will see you again very soon. Take care.